Hello, and thank you for joining us for another Wednesday chat. I'm doing the Minor Prophets. We're going to look at Obadiah today, and I'll bet that's a book you probably never heard a sermon on. I don't think I've ever preached a sermon on Obadiah. I suggest, if you've never read the book, that perhaps after the chat, to read it. We really know nothing about him. We do not know what kings were in power when he was prophesying. He doesn't mention any. We know his name means servant of the Lord. He was a prophet of Judah who spoke a word against their neighbor Edom. Edom was located southeast of Judah in the mountains around the Dead Sea. Today that would be in Jordan. Verse 3 mentions the clefts of the rocks. The word rocks in the Greek is Petra. The city of Petra was there. Petra is a famous place which can only be reached through a narrow pass. Once in Edom, there were thousands of temples. It was known for its wisdom. Eliphaz, one of Job's comforters, was from there. It was a fortress city thought to be impregnable to invasion. As a result, the people were proud, but they were destroyed completely. Esau is the founder of this country, Edom. And like Esau, the people were insensitive to spiritual things. Esau's descendants refused to allow the Jews to pass through their land on the way to the promised land in Numbers 20. So there was always this antagonism between Jacob and Esau and their descendants into history. Obadiah's prophecy against them was fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar, through the Nabitans, defeated them in 582 B.C. They moved them out into the desert from the mountain region. They were incorporated into Israel, Judaism, even though they weren't Jews. King Herod was an Edomite, Edomian. They were destroyed forever by Rome in 70 AD. Now, scholars differ on when this took place, when the book was written. But it must be after an invasion of Jerusalem, which there were several. Egypt invaded in 925 BC, the Philistines in 840, Jehoash from northern Israel in 790, and the Babylonians in 586 BC. So most scholars hold to the Nebuchadnezzar Babylonian invasion is best. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah. His message is a prophecy against Edom for violence done against his brother Jacob. He stood aloof at his day of calamity, so the day of the Lord is coming for him. They mocked and pillaged, defeated Judah, so God brought the same on them. Obadiah is the shortest book of the Old Testament, just 21 verses, written in 585 B.C. Here's a brief outline. Verses 1 to 9, the prophecy of Edom's destruction. Verses 10 to 14, the cause of Edom's destruction. And verses 15 to 21, judgment on the nations and the deliverance of Judah. Let's look at those verses in a little more detail. Verses 1 through 9, the destruction of Edom. God sent word to the nations to attack Edom, showing that God is in control of the nations of the world. It's good to remember that with what's happening in our world today. The Nabitans were their Arab neighbors who attacked them because of their pride. They thought their stronghold would keep them safe, but they, it did not. They'd be entirely looted. They thought that their ally, Babylon, would come to their aid, but they attacked them too. They had placed their security in Babylon, but it was misplaced security. They trusted in their worldly wisdom, but it was no help. They came to ruin. I'm going to read verses 10 to 14. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, 
nor look down on them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. So they stood and laughed while Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. They even helped out. They captured Jewish fugitives, killed some, and made other slaves. In verses 15 to 21, the Bible says that the day of the Lord is coming for Edom and all the nations. There will be judgment for what you sow, you reap. Where are all the great empires of the world? They're in ruins, and Edom will be too. But Mount Zion will rise again and get their land back. The Davidic kingdom will be restored once again, north, east, south, and west. The exiles will come back to the land, and God will rule forever. Themes of the book, God is sovereign over the nations. Pride goes before a fall. Jacob and his spiritual descendants will pass through suffering to ultimate restoration, and Esau and his proud, rebellious descendants will be destroyed. Okay, little competition with our lawn crew, but I think it's going to be over hopefully within seconds. On Easter morning, when Ed spoke on um, Matthew 26, I was really, um, I just heard anew about his silence in the six trials, and yet when he gave a confession in Matthew 26, 64, he answered the high priest, you have said so regarding him being the son of God. You will from now on see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. This utterance of truth sealed his fate, but it seemed like with new ears I heard this and declared inside, this is the one I want to follow. What it took for him to confess that truth was courage at its height. This test was also though playing out for Peter and the other two. Jesus had beforehand said directly, to them, watch and pray for the spirit is willing, and but the flesh is weak. By saying this to Peter, he was acknowledging your spirit is willing, but Peter's opportune hour to pray passed, and he would have to move in to the story we know quite well of his denial in the entry hall to the palace. The calmer hour of watch and pray had come and went. Peter was willing, but he didn't know how strong his own weak flesh would be. Even playing out in sleeping when he had resolved and the others to remain attentive to him. Taking that opportune hour, Peter would, have had, would still have been enough distance from the calamity that would later suck him in. We too want to recognize that hour when we are before and distant enough from the centrifugal force where we will be sucked in. What we want and need to be asking Heavenly Father for ourselves during watch and pray is exactly what Peter evidently needed to be asking him, but didn't. So he was not prepared. If Peter could have watched and prayed as Jesus told him, would he have responded differently? So we can assume from what Jesus taught us, even in the Lord's Prayer about temptation, that watching and praying will be a source of strength for that untimely revolt and surprise of our own strong flesh. The wild strength of it, the hour when our ignited flesh would be so attracted and connecting to fear, to flee, to denial, to not be prepared. Ellicott said, reality, with what they may need to bear, it is not wise to negligently pass by the hour to pray until they will find themselves in too close a contact with its power. Fall into be vanquished. Galatians 5.17 tells us, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Spirit watchful, flesh weak, spirit desires, body fatigued, their flesh would stand so strongly contrary to their spirit willingness that they could not stand without a higher strength than their own. I keep saying strong, but Jesus said weak. 
flesh. Do we know our own? So by receiving the authority of Jesus' command to watch and pray that night, we can gain that strength would have come. We seek strength on high by prayer. It could have been through prayer. Where power comes from, where we obtain, we pray to obtain. When we ask, we obtain from him. So Jesus' trial is imminent, but they could have asked God for grace to withstand. If the disciples had prayed and were given strength not to flee as they did, how could it have looked? Well, I think Jesus gave that very visual to us in that confession. You have said so to the high priest and those there. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So if you think silence and more silence in these six trials, but when he spoke, it was time and the truth needed to be expressed. He was true and what they needed to hear was truth. And it would be truth that would push them into a corner to have to receive or reject him. I see that time coming. What Jesus had spoken to the three to overcome was now happening to him. A true dealing for Jesus to also walk through. Hebrews 5, 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. So in both spirit and flesh, so to speak, Jesus overcame. That's beautiful. But was the result beautiful? It can be, it can be if we let obedience reform what beauty is to us. May we do this, but our flesh so strongly clings to the cost that it was for him and could be for us. It's all too clear in our mind the images of the immediate reaction to this confession. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? So the fists were punching, mocking, spitting, and then onto scourging and crucifixion. This is where our knees shake and our flesh is weak. And Jesus understands and says it is. So we need to pray to obtain. There is a legitimate urge to cover this vulnerable part of our human existence of entering into temptation, one that will test our faith. We learn it's wise to vigilantly and prayerfully seek and obtain from God while we are not too close, while thickening and incoming calamities come in view to the power source. Barnes, um, I just want to quote part of this. There's just a mercy to understand the disciples' vulnerability. Because what was going to meet up with them to overcome and oppress with trials their faith to deny Jesus. But here they were. Quote, the word temptation here properly means that would that what would test their faith in the approaching calamities, in his rejection and death, it would try their faith. Because though they believed that he was the Messiah, they were not very clearly aware of the necessity of his death, and they did not fully understand that he was to rise again. They had cherished the belief that he was to establish a kingdom while he lived. When they should see him therefore rejected, tried, crucified, dead, when they should see him submit to all this as if he did not have power to deliver himself, it was then would be the trial of their faith. I think we can relate to this. And in view of that, he exhorted them to pray that they may not so enter temptation as to be overcome by it and fall. This is real reality. Our human nature is weak, weak and shrinks as trials come, unable to sustain in the hour of temptation. So there's a watch part, a watching part, as Jesus said, Matthew 26, 40, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watching directs to the power we need to use. Watching even inside of our nature, realizing the sense of our flesh will direct us to special protection and help from God. Watching honestly assesses that it's not in our own power to stand without God's help and that praying to obtain will help and will not be denied us. 
physical watching imparts the sacredness of spiritual watching. There is a duo, I quote, of watch and pray equaling Christian duty. Watch sees the temptations coming. Prayer gives strength to withstand it. Colossians 4.2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So then the purpose of watch, then we have the purpose of pray, is to pray against the experience of temptation. We realize the major temptation for us is the configuration of just the right triggers to trap and deny him like what was staged for Peter. Temptation is that which we will fall into and be vanquished by, immersed so as to forsake Jesus or deny him. We ask not to be led in circumstances to prove ourselves unfaithful to Jesus, yet also we avoid getting into outward circumstances that will prove dangerous overall. We ask to be preserved from new sin. Knowing the struggle of the flesh against the spirit, we pray not to be led away with a moral trial, allurements, a great moral danger, trials, sufferings, testings, afflictions, shrinking even if the result is good. Some say all the above is a temptation we pray not to enter. Well, in John 6, 6, Jesus said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do, <coughs> Acts 16, 7. And when they had come up from Magia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Another testing. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Not realizing, not realizing about yourself that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. So Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. He didn't teach us to be stoic but honest to our consciousness of weakness. I've always considered it so self-centered in myself, how I would lean on this part of the Lord's Prayer, almost rush to it. But I see, in a sense, conscious of weakness, I realize I may fail in the conflict. But now I see that conscious of my own weakness is better than being sleepy. My sense of weakness has often edged, egged me forth to call out. Yes, it's there in me. But in this honest asking, I've seen that this has been accepted by the Father. Perhaps I'm now realizing those have been some of my most honest, sincere prayers. So David prayed, Do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. Do not let, he's saying, suffer us not, permit us not, don't afflict us or try us. And the answer could be exemption, escape, strength to bear it. But if it comes and we enter that room of temptation, there's room for a deliverer. He taught us, but deliver us from the evil one. To stand in the evil day, Paul said, 2 Timothy 4.18, from the lion's mouth, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom the Lord will deliver me. There's a deliverance and rescue to draw to himself. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, living in true God, the living in true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So hopefully a working of long suffering is happening in you and me, but how far will we go to fill up the sufferings in our flesh, like Paul said, Colossians 1 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh, filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. That is the church. So I can tell you, I've had just a sense of strong alertness in recent prayers that we really need to watch and pray for the conviction Peter needed to pray that hour, and he didn't. Not knowing what temptation is out there lying for each of us. As pulpit commentary had said, watch and pray is as the sum of Christian duty. I think we need to see it actively engaged in us from here on. 
this is our hour where calamity may still seem a bit out there. If that's the case, this is not the time to sleep, but this hour is an hour, and it's an hour to watch and pray. All right, let's pray then. Lord, I think from Obadiah and the verses that I read, it really spoke to me to not gloat over our enemy in any way, but to be like you, Jesus, to forgive our enemy. So, Father, I pray that we would uh, take away always um, just walking closely with you and being in the center of your will. In Jesus' name, amen.